Welcome to Roundabout Oxford, a podcast from the University of Mississippi Libraries. Today, Roundabout Oxford goes meta with a podcast episode about podcasting. This fall, members of the Roundabout team had the privilege of speaking to the Southeastern Library Association about how and why we make this podcast. In this episode, we share the spotlight with other podcasters, starting with Blake Thompson, host of the locally focused Beyond the Square and Oxford Charger podcasts. Later, UM librarians Adam Clemens and Abby Norris Davidson discuss their recent experience being interviewed for the BBC's Breaking Mississippi podcast and the digital humanities project that caught the attention of the show's producers. We then close out the show with the podcasting debut of University Health Services Director Alex Langhart and his new segment, What's Plaguing Us? Hello, my name is Harley Rogers, and today I will be speaking with Blake Thompson, uh, who is the creator of Beyond the Square, the Oxford podcast, and the Oxford Charger podcast. So to start, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and of your current podcasts and really how you got started with podcasts? Sure. Um I, my wife and I have been living here in Oxford for about 15 years. I am a realtor um, and we've been raising our four kids. I have a, a daughter in college, a daughter that's a senior here at Oxford High School, and then an eighth grade son and a fifth grade son. So we've been enjoying Oxford for, uh, like I said, right around 15 or so years. But um, in terms of podcasting, probably back in the mid 2000s, I started listening to some and there's a small handful of them because there weren't a ton of podcasts even out then. But one in particular was on the the television show Lost that was on ABC. And if you've ever seen Lost, it's really in, in, intriguing, but there's a lot of questions about what's really going on there. And so there's a podcast that I listened to that was, they would have like a, an immediate, I guess, response episode right after the, the show was on. But then they would have another one where there's a lot of fan theories and speculation, what's going on and all. And I really enjoyed it. And there's another TV show that came out around that time called Friday Night Lights, which I thought then and still do that it was probably the, my favorite TV show ever. And I wanted to find a podcast that was like the Lost podcast. And I would search in iTunes every so often and there wasn't one. And this was even back in the days when you had to download to iTunes on my desktop computer and then drag and drop to an MP3 player before the iPhone was out. Uh, I'm dating myself, I guess, but I kept looking for uh, one for, for Friday Night Lights. And so Finally, I thought, how hard could it be? I started Googling and I actually emailed the guys that did that Lost podcast and just got some tips and then just kind of rolled up my sleeves and jumped in without really knowing how it was going to go. I had set up a couple of podcasts for a, a, a two churches I'd been a part of before. So I knew a little bit of the back end, but as far as the the weekly production and trying to interview people and stuff like that, I was completely green. But I had uh, reached out to a few of the not main actors because they were not even on Twitter. And Twitter was kind of still young, I guess, at the time. But some of the some of the um, supporting actors and actresses on Twitter just saying, hey, I have a podcast. Here's what a podcast is. Would you want to be on it and talk about your experience with Friday Night Lights? And they came on. And honestly, it was it was a blast. It was fun. But it was just me. And it was me by myself talking for whatever, 30, 40 minutes about the TV show, about what was going on. And a friend of mine who liked the Friday Night Lights TV show as well said, you have a podcast. I don't know why you do about it, but then I sat and listened to you talk for 35 minutes about it. So if you do it for the next season, I'm in. And so when it renewed for season um, four and five, three other friends of mine and I, so there's me, there is Russ, Lyle and Pat. Uh, I mean, it was, we talked about it just as if my wife made fun of us. Cause she said, y'all talk about these people as if they're, you know, real, real life people, but they're just characters on a TV show. But um, we got to interview some of the, actors and actresses that some of the main ones reached out to by the uh, director of photography that wanted to come on and so that was just kind of an introduction to to podcasting and i fell in love with it and then there was like this big stretch of where i hadn't done one in a while and living here in oxford there's i've, I've always had i guess a handful of ideas about what a good podcast would be and i still do but um i had 
started a magazine back in 2014 for the Wellsgate neighborhood here on the west side of town. And it was called Beyond the Gates. And it was a magazine for the residents, about the residents. And, you know, it was attractive to local advertisers because of, um, you know, the residents there and all. But each month there was a set of articles that were there. There was always a family of the month a pet, a student, an athlete of the month, a sponsor of the month who was one of the advertisers. And so a lot of people in the company that I was working through called into publishing would usually just email out a bullet list of questions and the resident or the athlete or whoever would just email back, you know, the answers. And then they would just basically copy and paste it almost directly into the magazines. But my preferred method of doing it was to be able to go to someone's home and sit down in their living room or their kitchen table or meet somebody at, you know, the local coffee shop, put my phone on airplane mode, start the voice recorder and just record a conversation because you get more of the dialogue, the back and forth, you get to follow up questions, you get to uh, see the, how they respond. Um, especially if it's, you know, a husband and wife both talking, um, that was that made for a much better story and made a much more interesting way to tell that as well. Um, and I'm, uh, they got to point, like I said, I'm in real estate and I had to realize I'm either going to focus on real estate or uh, the magazine. So I let the magazine go, but I always missed those those conversations, whether it's somebody about what made them move to Oxford and why they love it or you know, uh, a 12 year old talking about being able to, they made the volleyball team at the middle school and the joy of that that brought to them, or even just somebody's, you know, talking about their, their pet, not having done the magazine in a while. Um, I missed those stories. I started thinking that Oxford itself has a whole lot of stories. And so I started uh, beyond the square just because I know that like, if you were to try to make a brochure of Oxford, and what it is that makes Oxford special and attractive to, to people. Obviously, you're gonna have the square, you're gonna have campus in the Grove, you'll have likely Roanoke and you know some of the restaurants and nightlife and whatnot. But I think it's really the people and the stories of the people here in Oxford that make Oxford special, make it what it is. And so I've had this idea knocking around in my head for, I mean, it's been four or five years easily. And um, my wife finally said, either just do it or quit talking about it because it's, you know, you've been talking about it for way too long. So it's just a way to get back to the community, I guess, a little bit. Plus, it's uh, I, I just like hearing people's stories. And I think others would find it as interesting as well. Absolutely. Um, so what is your process for coming up with episode ideas um, for your your current podcast specifically and maybe how that's different from your previous ones? With the Friday Night Lights podcast, I mean, it was pretty much straightforward. I mean, they would have a, a weekly episode and then once it was out, you know, uh, the other co-hosts and I would just talk about what happened and what we you know we enjoyed about it, what we thought was, was kind of goofy or what we expected and thought might happen later on. And then if there was somebody, one of the, one of the cast members or whatever that came on. But with this, it's, it's a lot more local, fo locally focused. Um, and I think it's really just looking for people that I guess that are interesting people who have, maybe they've lived a number of years here in Oxford and experienced life throughout the decades and the change that Oxford has, has experienced, or maybe somebody that's brand new and is kind of on the front end of starting a business. And they have this entrepreneurial spirit and see that Oxford has opportunities here for for, for them and for the business and for to be able to impact the community. So it's really just people with a passion and a love for Oxford and want to see it thrive. Uh, people who are, you know, hoping to make a difference, make an impact for the good. And so, the, you know, so my wife, you know, will sometimes give me some ideas of people who can uh, maybe be on and all. And so it's really just for people who have a good background, who are, who are, you know, able to, to speak openly and passionately about what it means to live here at Oxford. Um, and then, so, and then kind of goes from there, I'll reach out to either through email or text. If it's somebody I know already, it's usually fairly, fairly direct, but sometimes, you know, I'm going to start trying to email out do some cold emails, I guess, to some people. And so, yeah, so a lot of times it's even some crowdsourcing that goes on there with it. Um, so you've been doing this for a little while. Um, can you tell me about one of the most memorable moments? I'd say memorable. Uh, there's looking back to the Friday Night Lights podcast, you know, it was really surreal, I guess, to be able to watch the first three seasons and really get into a television program and you get to know the characters and the the plot and all. But then uh, going into those last two, it was five seasons total of the TV show. And we had the podcast for the middle of season three through the end of the, the entire series. 
And then to be able to reach out through either a publicist or an agent or whatnot, some of the uh, A-list actors, I would say, that are some of the some of the top names that were a part of the uh, series, and be able to talk with them. Uh, it was almost always through Skype, but still being able to talk to uh, Zach Guilford, who played Matt Saracen, or Brad Leland, who played Buddy Garrity. And if anybody's watched the TV series before, they know who those characters are immediately. And that was kind of a surreal moment, um, you know, just to hear the people that are that love our community here within Oxford, love the university as well. And it's just to hear the appreciation of our, our town, our, our small city and their voices is always good. But those are some of the, some of the highlights I think right there that I've been able to, to have so far, but hope to have many more as well. So in your experience, have you found it more challenging or maybe easier to get in touch with people now compared to when you first began? It's probably a mixed bag because I'd say back then, when I first started with like the Friday Night Lights podcast, there was, there weren't a lot of podcasts out there already. So sometimes people say, what's a podcast? And he goes, well, it's kind of like a, a radio show, but it's on the internet and people can download it. And now it goes straight to their iPhones or whatnot. And like, okay, yeah, sure. Whatever. Um, and cause there wasn't very much, I guess you'd say competition. Now there are more and more and more podcasts out there. And so it's a lot more common, but maybe there's a lot more asking, I guess, too. Um, I think, here on the local level, uh, it's not been as, as, you know, I'm not having to reach anybody's publicist to talk to somebody here in Oxford, or at least there hasn't had to yet. So it's not been too difficult on the local level. I would say, um, if I was trying to reach somebody that was major, like a major celebrity or somebody that was, you know, in New York or LA or someone just not here within North Mississippi, it may be a little bit more, but I find that most of the time, if you let people know, here's what I'm doing. Here's how I think that you would benefit our audience. And then, you know, the, plus give you some recognition and give you some, some publicity as well. Most people, as long as you're respectful of their time are willing to, to, to give their time and be a part and have a conversation. Uh, what if any challenges have you encountered? I think one of the challenges I had early on, and I, I think I briefly kind of touched on it was that i I kept waiting, trying to, you know, think through it. And, and my wife finally said, just go and do it, you know, and I learned that done is better than perfect. Go ahead and getting something done because I would kind of get stuck into this paralysis by analysis, wanting to make sure the social media was just right, or I had a web page, or I had, you know, the, the logo was just perfect or all this stuff when, um, and I would sometimes kind of get stuck in a rut. And so I think that was a challenge personally, um, just to get off the launch pad because I was trying to make sure everything was, was just hundred percent right. And I realized, and I, I, yeah, I, even though I knew it, I finally realized that podcasting is like just about anything else is that, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Sometimes you just got to go and have some course correction to make some adjustments on the fly as you continue to go through that. So for me, that was a challenge. It was just kind of getting off the, the launch pad. What tip would you give to someone who wants to start a podcast of their own? I think the first tip is that you need to have a subject matter or a theme or whatever that you're wanting to podcast about. Make sure there's something that you really do care about. Um, I think as podcasting has grown in popularity, uh, sometimes there are people that say, Hey, my friends and I, you know, get together on whatever's Friday afternoon or Saturday night. And we, we have really funny conversations. I know other people would like it too. Uh, but make sure that, whatever you're talking about has it's kind of specific and narrowed down to where other people are going to have the same appreciation, but make sure it's a subject matter that you actually like. I think that sometimes people think, Hey, I'm going to start a podcast and grow a big audience and make a lot of money and get really famous. And it's a lot more, unless you're a celebrity already, I think it's a lot more difficult to, uh, to, to see that grow into fruition. So unless you really enjoy what it is that you're podcasting about, what your subject matter is, um, it's, it's going to be more of a chore, uh, and not as much of an enjoyment and it's, you want it to be something that you enjoy. So I, I think, yeah, I think first tip is just make sure it's something that you're, you're, that you love, that you're passionate about, that you could talk about, even if nobody else was listening, if it was something. And then two, just have a, uh, a good mic, I think goes a long way. I think quality sound is, is, is key. I do think that the content, what it is you talk about is primary, but if you have excellent content, but you have a, a cruddy microphone and, you know, there's a lot of noise with in the room you're recording, then nobody's going to listen. But on the flip side, you could have studio quality audio, 
but if it's boring, nobody wants to listen either. So make sure it's a subject matter that you care about. And you can, and others can feel and understand uh, your your passion for it, and then have make sure you you have a good microphone. You know what I think what's unique about podcasting is is that if you go listen on the radio and you know you're driving across town or you're taking a road trip on the weekend and you just have the radio on, you don't really know what's going to come on next, and so you're just like I like this station or like you know I know that they play whatever you know eighties music. Uh, from from you know four to six today or whatnot, but you're really at the mercy of whatever they're going to play. For a podcast, if somebody's listened to one, almost ninety nine percent of the time they have clicked to download that or subscribe to it already, and then they've clicked on their you know iPhone or Android or whatnot. They said play this specific episode for me, so that's been very intentional, and so it's it's something that you have like, access to. You know, and if people are using earbuds or AirPods or whatnot, you're literally talking into their head. And so take that as uh, as a responsibility that comes with it, some uh, some perks, but at the same time, there, there's a bit of a deeper responsibility there, I think. But I think it can be an intimate medium um, and just enjoy it. And I think there's, you know, there are podcasts about all kinds of stuff you would never even think of would be, would have a listenership. And so it's amazing what's out there. So if you do think about starting one, yeah, it's, it's easy. I do encourage you to listen to uh, beyond the square, the Oxford pod. Uh, You can find that, you know, quite easily just type that into any of your, uh, your normal uh, listening apps that you have. Uh, But it's, it's easy to find. If you have any suggestions or feedback, you can DM me there on uh, the Oxford pod on Twitter. Brooke Gross. I'm here with Abby and Adam to talk about their experience as podcast interviewees. To get started, why don't you both tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do here at the university? I am Abby Morris Davidson. I am the Digital Initiatives Librarian and Assistant Professor, and my primary role at the University Libraries is to work as an administrator on the University Repository eGrowth. And this is Adam Clemens. I'm a digital humanities and data visualization librarian and assistant professor at the University of Mississippi Libraries. Um, My primary role is to support the research that utilizes digital humanities or more broadly digital scholarship tools and and methodologies. Thank you all so much uh, for meeting with us. You all were recently interviewed on another podcast not affiliated with the university for a project that you worked on related to the University of Mississippi's 60th anniversary of integration. Can you talk a little bit about what that project was? Yes. So Adam and I have over the past few years been building a geospatial humanities project. The Library Archives has a collection of letters that were sent to James Meredith during his attempts to integrate the university. And as we were looking over these letters, we noticed that a lot of them had return addresses. And we were curious about where the letters had been sent from and also the sentiment of the letters the archivist who processed the collection has split the letters into either pro-integration or anti-integration. And we were curious to see where in the U.S. and where in the world pro-letters were coming from, where anti-letters were coming from, and if it would push against expectations about where these letters were coming from. So we created this project to coincide with the 60th anniversary celebrations of the integration of the university. We knew that there would be a lot of events planned. And so we thought that this was a great collection to draw attention into the archives and the institutional repository, but then also to the campus climate of the university and what was going on. We have been building a map in ArcGIS and we have now completed our pilot phase of our project and are planning on uh, continuing the project. And we hope to add all of the letters that have return addresses in the collection in the near future. 
prior to the interview that y'all recently did kind of for this project, um, did either of you have any podcasting experience, creating a podcast, being interviewed on a podcast, listening to podcasts, anything like that? What was your podcasting background before that interview? Um, I know I had not been interviewed for a podcast. I delved a little bit, I think, years ago in uh, creating podcasts, I think largely unsuccessfully, uh, but I am a large consumer of podcasts as sort of a medium. During my sort of daily exercise routine, for instance, I listen to a number of different podcasts. I'm a really big fan of sort of the long form, I guess, and deep dives in particular topics. And so I really appreciate, you know, the way the podcast allowed that sort of to happen. Um, and it's convenient for me as a strictly audio that, you know, I can just put on my my earbuds um, and go. So I'm a big consumer of podcasts, I guess, is what would be one day, way to describe that. I was definitely introduced to podcasts as a consumer. I am an avid podcast listener. I spend a lot of hours in the car. And for some reason, I seem to prefer listening to podcasts over listening to music or audiobooks these days. I do have some experience in the podcast production world. I was one of the founding members of uh, the Roundabout podcast, which we are now interviewing for. Went through the whole process of figuring out what we wanted it to look like, what we wanted the name to be, all of these things, and then uh, producing episodes, interviewing individuals. And I was interviewed for the podcast once myself. Now y'all have seen one way that we do podcasting through the UM Library Podcast Committee. We're on Zoom right now. We're doing a recording of this meeting, which will be edited down into an interview, which will go into an episode that is put up on YouTube. Uh, We primarily use Zoom, Audacity, and OpenShot, which are all open source tools. Now that you've been involved in this podcast and you've also been involved in a totally separate podcast, can you talk a little bit about what your experience was like being interviewed for your other podcast for this project? how it compares to this, some things that you enjoyed about it, and things that, you know, maybe surprised you or intrigued you. When you describe your project, it it seems like there's a big visual component. So describing that and talking about that in an audio form, if y'all could touch on just a little bit about what that was like and your experience as a whole as interviewees. Yeah, to begin with, yeah, but as Abby described our project, you know, one of the sort of principal purposes of a digital humanities project is to raise awareness of a particular project or collection in this case. And so that was one of the thoughts that we had in mind with the letters themselves that, that Mr. Meredith received. This project would help raise awareness of, of that collection uh, in a unique way. It might help reveal interesting things um, about the letters as we map them out, like where they came from. But raising awareness, making them more accessible kind of thing was a, was really important to us. Um, and so naturally, when we were asked to, you know, interview about the, the collection itself or the project itself, um, you know, we were happy to do that. Um, it, there is a very large visual component, like you said. Um, but again, just getting an opportunity to talk about our project, uh, you know, that, that's always great, I think. And so we're happy to do that. <laughs> One of the things, and I'll take responsibility for this, uh, that I noticed differently from that experience to this experience is that, you know, Brooke, you shared with us the questions in advance and sort of laid out all of the, you know, the details of what we could expect. At the time of communication with the previous experience or the the other podcast um, interview, uh, Abby was away. So I was basically communicating with the producer of this podcast and I never asked for any questions up front and the producer never volunteered those questions. And so, When we, you know, when we showed up for the interview, we didn't know what to expect, I guess. We were, um, we we knew we'd talk about or, you know, answer questions related to our project, but we didn't know anything beyond that. So that was certainly one thing, um, you know, if we had done it over or if we were to do that over, I would probably at least ask for those questions. I don't know. I mean, everybody's different. He may, this person may just not uh, provide questions in advance. I mean, I'll have those questions in advance. I don't know. But that was certainly a distinct difference. It was funny, our experience with the podcast, I think the word that comes to mind is whirlwind. It was a it was a one-man show and he was visiting from 
out of the country for, I think, less than a week and had a jam-packed schedule because uh, they were, you know, producing a podcast about the integration and so had a lot of people on campus and in Mississippi that they wanted to talk to. And I think even in states other than Mississippi, he was really traveling all over the country to interview people for this podcast. And so we had one hour time slot that ended up turning into 30 minutes because the library can be hard and confusing to navigate. And we kept on <laughs> having just, you know, conversations with him. And then he explained to us that the podcast was going to total, I believe, 120 or 140 minutes, you know, yeah. for everyone that he was talking to. So it was one of those, tell me about your project, but it might only be, you know, a sound bite or one quote that gets into the final project. So I think if memory serves, we didn't even talk about the visualization aspect of our project so much because he did not anticipate there would be enough time to delve into that. It was more a very blanket explanation of what our project was and then talking more about what the project had uncovered and made us think about. Yeah, I mean, it basically the emphasis was on the letters themselves. I think yeah, that's what the bulk of our time I think, was spent um, essentially selecting a few letters to read yeah, once we had sort of described what our project was about and what we we're trying to do. You're right, Abby, that was basically the, the extent of, of, of that aspect. And then it just became sort of a, a chance for us to highlight some of the distinct differences between the kinds of letters that that Mr. Meredith received, not just in the sense that, you know, some were in support or sympathetic and then others were not, but also to try to highlight some of the sort of nuance of hatred, I guess, that came through in some of those unsympathetic letters, right, that some were much more sort of extreme um, than others. And some of that came out in our, I guess, reading of those letters might be one way to describe it, which... I was not prepared to do, but, you know, we were able to find letters, you know, that captured sort of the sentiment of what he was looking for. We did that and he, you know, he would sort of give us feedback based on our, our takes. He would try not to guide what we were saying, but then also very clearly had kind of a narrative idea in his mind that um, he wanted to fit our story into so it was interesting to see how our experience, which, you know, it's just been the two of us working on this project for two years. And so it can be very, you know, not siloed, but very focused, I guess, very focused on our project to see how it kind of fit into this broader narrative that was surrounding the 60th anniversary celebrations. There was very much a director sort of element if at least from my perspective, um, like Abby said, there wasn't, you know, he, he was very clear that, you know, it was, you know, we we're free to say whatever we wanted. Um, but there was, I want to say coaching, but encouragement or guidance or something. I'm not sure what word may be most appropriate, but yeah, he was, we were, you know, given free reign, but we, we were kind of given an idea, you know, of, of what was trying to be achieved. And, and again, thinking that we only had, I think, I believe there were going to be 10 total episodes at 14 minutes a piece and our interview alone ended up being 30 plus minutes and knowing as Abby said that he had you know visited multiple places on a whirlwind uh, trip we had to be very sort of careful and choosy with what we what we did say and what we did elaborate on so we interviewed uh at in the studio one in the library uh, JD Williams library here on campus that space is set up for um uh, that screen I think it has still has screen screen um capabilities and uh, it's effectively a one-touch studio, uh, but he had his own equipment. It was all sort of portable, but he had this enormous microphone, everything that he needed to to make the audio uh, recording. And so Abby and I, we had each had a, a nice, comfortable sort of lounge chair. We moved, I think there was a, like a small crescent table that he had moved towards uh, kind of in front of our chairs so that we were almost sitting at a desk, if that makes sense, where both the chairs were pulled up to the table. And then he's behind the table and, and behind him is the wall. And so it's a very tight space. I'm just trying to create the, you know, the image. And in an already small room, I don't know, Abby, we were at least maybe five feet in diameter between the three of us. Um, and he has this, it must have been two feet long 
uh, microphone that was <laughs> positioned within effectively several inches of our faces. And that microphone would, would then rotate, you know, and he was managing it. It would rotate left to right, depending on, you know, who was speaking. And so, you know, when you're trying to be sort of careful with what you're saying um, and articulate, that's can be a challenge in and of itself, but it's sort of magnified when you have this microphone in your face. And so I just want to say that to create the, you know, there was a, a level of intensity, I guess, that kind of came along with that uh, setup. And I think that was just done, you know, because it, it helped eliminate any potential background noise and would make his job easier, um, you know, as he went to edit, produce. But it certainly created an environment where um, we were very close together, and and yeah, at least in my experience, I had not you know ever done anything like that, so it was it was interesting. Based on your experiences with that podcast, with this one, um, being a consumer, having worked with podcasts before, things like that, I'd love to know y'all's overall thoughts about podcasting as a format or a medium. And if you think that podcasting is something that y'all are wanting to get more into after having kind of seen both sides of it. I mean, it certainly gives me a greater appreciation of what goes into it as a consumer of podcast. You know, I, I had up to that point, not really considered, you know, everything that goes in, into a podcast production. I mean, it's, I, I certainly think of things differently now in terms of being involved with podcasts. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great medium to, to spread awareness, to talk about things that you're interested in all that sort of stuff. And so I think that's a, that's something I'd certainly be interested in, in being a part of. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to do further podcast interviews in the, for, in the future about, you know, just about anything again, because I, I appreciate what podcasts are, are able to offer. And I think that plenty of people clearly uh, uh, utilize that, that podcast format. Yeah, I agree. I think that podcasting is a wonderful medium and it has been exciting to see how it's evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. I feel like it blends, at least for me, it blends the best of both worlds between, you know, visual content, YouTube, movies, and music. I love that podcasts can run the gamut from being, you know, two friends talking and making you crack up on the other side of the screen to, you know, getting people who were wrongfully convicted, um, cleared of all charges and I think it will be really interesting to see you know what happens to the podcasting world in the next 10 or 15 years um, and it's definitely something that I enjoy participating in and would love to take part in more in the future. Alex Langhart was similarly inspired by the experience of being a podcast interviewee the director of University Health Services joined us in episode 10 to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the campus community. And today, he returns to Roundabout Oxford as host of a brand new segment, What's Plaguing Us? Hey, it's Alex Langhart, director of University Health Services at the University of Mississippi. I'm obsessed with public health and its history, and I'm excited for this opportunity the Roundabout Oxford podcast has given me to share my passion with you in a series called What's Plaguing Us. This first segment will be all about the flu. Flu season in the Southern Hemisphere typically runs April through September and has been used as a predictor for flu season in the Northern Hemisphere. Our friends down under had a bad flu season, and unfortunately so far, we seem to be following suit. What do we do? Well, we do like we've done every year since the invention of a little shot in the 1940s. Get the flu vaccine. Or we find an excuse not to get the vaccine. Erroneous ones like, it gave me the flu, or it never works, or flu isn't that bad. Why do we have such a complicated relationship with the influenza virus? Let's first look at what it is. There are two main types of human flu viruses, types A and B. For brevity, let's focus on A as that is the real troublemaker. Influenza A has the ability to cause flu pandemics due to its propensity for virus reassortment. Now, this is the process by which there's a swapping of gene segments. Influenza A is divided into subtypes based on two surface-level proteins, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. You may have heard of a virus subtype being named like H1N1 or H3N2. This is referring to those antigens. More than 130 influenza A subtype combinations have been identified in nature. That's extremely alarming to think about. Why? 
Well, let's take a trip back in time and discuss the forgotten pandemic of 1918 and see what the implications are for influenza type A's ability for reassortment. Arthur Dury Davis was a logger who relocated from North Carolina to Tennessee when his logging camp closed. When the pandemic hit, he found work in digging graves. This seemed to be a pretty popular occupation at the time because his direct quote was, There was no time to build coffins since the bodies were put in the ground as soon as possible. Arthur tells a story where one morning at 6 a.m. he was set to work digging three graves for a family of six that lived down the road from him. Around 9 a.m., the doctor sent word to dig yet another grave. Then at lunchtime, he got word to dig another. And by 4 p.m., he was instructed to dig the final grave for that entire family. The 1918 flu is thought to have evolved from a strain that typically infected birds. It acquired mutations that allowed it to infect the upper respiratory system, and it was really good at it. I mean, it would replicate extremely quickly and then could be transmitted to the air via coughing and sneezing. Combine that with our immune systems not being previously exposed to a novel virus, and you have the perfect conditions for a catastrophic pandemic. Even worse, secondary bacterial infections contributed to the high death counts because they were able to infiltrate an extremely weakened body and develop pneumonia. Now, I think what struck fear the most in the population was of how many young adults were succumbing to severe illness. Some research estimates close to 50% of deaths were adults aged 20 to 40. Many scientists think that this is due to that age group not being exposed to a strain similar to the 1918 flu whereas older adults may have had some exposure to something similar since they were born before 1889. Also, our immune systems could have played a harmful role due to an intense immune response called a cytokine storm. This is a rapid release of immune cells and inflammatory molecules that overwhelms the body, leading to severe inflammation and fluid buildup in the lungs, increasing the chance for those secondary infections. A few scientists present the theory that younger immune systems would produce a stronger cytokine storm, thus being more destructive. I am reminded of the quote that luck is when opportunity meets preparation, and how in this scenario, worked perfectly for the virus. It came at a time when physicians were only just discovering the existence of viruses. In fact, they thought this pandemic was caused by a bacterium. They were a long way away from antiviral meds and the vaccines we know today. It wasn't until 1997 that we discovered the genetic sequence of the 1918 virus. The passing of a century since this dark mark on history contributed to this being labeled the forgotten pandemic. This was a gut check for public health response and medical advancement. We luckily survived and learned a lot along the way. It will never truly be forgotten. In fact, all influenza A pandemics since 1918, in almost all cases of influenza A worldwide, have been caused by descendants of the 1918 virus. It is truly the mother of all pandemics for the modern era. So, are we learning from our history? I posed the question earlier of why our relationship with influenza is so complicated. It's because we haven't seen the devastation on a global scale that a flu virus can cause. There have been flare-ups, sure, but most people associate the flu with mild symptoms, chills, cough, fever, and body aches. It's a much harder truth to swallow that we are one reassortment away from another tragedy. This current flu season has hit us a little harder because our immune systems have been shielded the past couple of years. Masks and social distancing have kept it at bay. Now that the world has opened up again, our immune systems are getting back used to all the crud that's out there. So let's be smart each flu season. Make sure to get your vaccine. Keep practicing good hand hygiene. Wear a mask if you are vulnerable or feel that you may be becoming sick. It takes everyone doing their part and looking out for each other. Thanks for listening to this segment of What's Plaguing Us. Roundabout Oxford was created by Brian Corgan, Taylor Fields, Alan Munshower, Abigail Norris Davidson, Christina Streeter, and Alex Watson. Today's episode was produced by Elizabeth Bat, Brian Corgan, Sarah Catherine Glass, Brooke Gross, Harley Rogers, and Alex Watson with guest contributor Alex Langhart and musical contributions from Brian Corgan and Gail Herrera. Thank you for listening to Roundabout Oxford.